Hi, I'm Marjorie Hudson. I'm the author of a new novel, Indigo Field. And I want to thank Boulder Books for giving me the chance to talk about it with you. Uh, here are some questions they would like me to answer. Let's see, I'm going to give you a brief synopsis. So Indigo Field is a novel about an abandoned field in the rural South where nothing is as it seems. Three people live near the field and they each see it completely differently. They live in bubble worlds uh, that do not intersect. One sees it as a place to escape his retirement community. One sees the field as a place to graze for goat herd in winter. And one sees it as a source of healing herbs and family stories that go back 300 years. So after, a, after the buried bones of a child wash out of the cliff next to the river, the secret stories of the field about loss, injustice, and revenge begin to be told, and the stories affect each family in a different way. So let me tell you more about my characters. The first character is the newcomer, a retired colonel living with his beautiful wife in an upscale retirement village. He feels terribly out of place in this upscale, fancy village. And he's confronting the fact that he has an untreatable heart condition. Uh, he has a great fear of ending up in the hospital hooked up to a slow death, he believes his wife is too soft-hearted to, um, to unplug him. So um, he's a runner, but he's been instructed not to run. However, he sneaks across the highway every day and sprints up a hill to a pine grove that looks down on the field. He's decided that he'll either get better or he'll die in the woods away from the possibility of rescue. One day he comes home from his run and gets the shock of his life. His wife has died first, aneurysm on the tennis court. That sets his feet on a different path than he had expected. The second character is Jolene Blake. She's a young widow raising a Down syndrome son on a small dairy farm. She owns the field and the Gouli Pines and uh, a, a garden, a farmer's garden and a, a small dairy. So she uses the field as winter pasture for her herd and as a place to remember lovemaking with her dead husband, now gone for 10 years. She's just hanging on with her farmer's market income and she's having trouble paying the bills. Her son, meanwhile, is becoming a moody teenager and she doesn't know how to help him anymore. The third character is Miss Reba Jones and she's the warm heart of the novel. She's an elderly black lady who hides her Tuscarora heritage under black skin. She goes to the field to gather herbs for healing and to remember her childhood and growing up, as well as to talk to the dead. Um, there are many spirits that she visits in this field. So she keeps also a list of crimes committed by white men against her people in the back of the family Bible. Uh, the latest crime is the murder of her beloved niece, Danielle, whom she raised from a young child. Uh, Miss Reba's stewing in her juices, as they say. She has thoughts of revenge um, as well as grief, all mingled together in a kind of a po poisonous brew. So each of these characters is visited by the spirits of the dead in different ways. Miss Reba, however, is being visited by Danielle's child spirit. 
And this child spirit keeps showing up in surprising ways and asking her aunt to tell the old stories, the stories of the field, the stories passed down about Tuscora people who lived there and about Reba and her sister when they were growing up. This Reba does not want to tell her of the dire crimes. So there's some stories she keeps to herself. These three worlds, which are completely different and kind of unaware of each other in many ways, collide because of Indigo Field. So what inspired me to write this book? Uh, it's interesting. I, I think becoming a Southerner inspired me to write this book. Um, I was a newcomer to Central Carolina, the rural South, and uh, had been living there about eight, six, seven, eight years when uh, when I started writing this. And I was grateful. I just loved where I live on a on a farm, a century farm in my husband's family fields and forests. The place nurtures me every day. Um, so part of what inspired me was delight in where I live. And then history. Uh, I learned very quickly that history in the South is family stories. It's, uh, it's stories told or untold. It's personal. So, uh, for example, I noticed that uh, when I moved to the farm that there were indigenous tools and arrowheads all over the place. Every time you dug a hole or gardened, you would find something. And I learned there were 20 distinct nations in North and South Carolina besides the Cherokee. So I did a little research and I, I learned that most people, including most historians, um, said that they had all been wiped out in the Tuscarora War as far back as 1711. But then I started um, meeting descendants of these nations in my community. So that went against the story that most people told that they had all been wiped out. So how had these people survived? That was a question that haunted me. Um, I was also inspired by a personal discovery. Um, Southern history is personal. So I, I learned that nobody in my town knew who the local middle school was named for, the school where my daughter attended. And no, check that, the white people didn't know, the black people did. Why was that? Um, turns out it was named for a famous black poet who sold his poems to buy his freedom from slavery. The identity of the school was um, kind of not talked about after, uh, after integration came. It had been a segregated school. So I also learned that lynching and other crimes against Black people during Jim Crow were never spoken of um, where I lived. I had thought that kind of thing only happened in the Deep South. So I got a real education. That kind of history was disappearing the same way Native American history seemed to have disappeared. So both those things bothered me and they were kind of brewing something in me that resulted in my novel. But there was a moment that sparked me to start writing, and that was a chance encounter. Uh, I saw an older man jogging on my road. People never jogged on my road in those days. Um, you know, it was so rural that people would actually stop their trucks and talk to each other in the middle of the road. Um, so one day I saw a jogger and uh, he was an older man and I wondered where in the world he had come from. It was so surprising. Uh, you know, I had seen joggers before, but not in this part of the South. It hadn't showed up here yet. Um, and I quickly realized he was probably from the retirement village across the highway where people were coming from New York and Connecticut. 
uh, to settle in rural North Carolina. But when this man passed me by, something happened. He looked me in the eye and had such a devastated expression on his face. It just about knocked me down. He kept going. I kept going. But I thought about it for days. And um, about a week later, I told a friend about this. And I, I said, I'm going to write a novel about that. Man. So I had been writing and publishing short stories. Um, for a couple of years, I had won some small awards, and I was feeling pretty excited about that. And uh, But writing a novel is something I had not done yet. Um, of course, I did not end up writing about just this one man who was probably from a retirement community. I wanted, I realized, to write about how this whole community fit together and how some people know the stories of the past but they're very careful not to tell them. I also wanted to say something about how the trees and fields are still dominant citizens here, because um, that it was so important to the feeling of where I live. Um, so uh, one more thing I wanna say, I had been freelancing as a copy editor for Algonquin Books of Chapel Hill, and so I was reading Southern literature for the first time, and I just went crazy for it. Uh, the big moral arcs of Southern novels and how they include all different kinds of people. I, um, I kind of aspire to be part of that conversation. So I think that's woven into the idea for Indigo Field. So what kind of research did I do while writing this story. I did tremendous amounts of research. I'm a journalist by background. I was determined to get the factual parts right um, and uh, to create you know, just a real clear dividing line, at least in my head, between what was fact and what was fiction. Um, but I started researching this novel before the Google, about 30 years ago. I read a lot of books about growing seasons, about plants, Native American history, Black history. I went to conferences um, and I do advocacy work uh, and people come to me and tell me their stories. I also read archeological studies. I went to a native foods cooking class at a powwow and I went to a, po a pottery workshop to learn how to make a pot in the style of the Tuscarora. I also um, read some primary sources, journals of first contact between English and native people. Um, so uh, one of the things that writers have to do is really understand their character as well. I felt like I understood Miss Reba and Jolene Blake pretty well, just from understanding my neighbors. But I really, the colonel was a mystery to me. So I had to come up with a backstory for him. Um, I needed a job for him and a hobby. Uh, and his, his uh, military service was between the wars during the Cold War. And it just so happened I was on a writing retreat in near San Francisco and right next door to where I was staying was the Nike Missile National Historical Site. Yes, there is a national park named for Nike missiles. I learned a lot about missile placements and the decommissioning process. And um, that became the Colonel's job. Um, he, he did secret work in that area and that really fit his personality because he's quite secretive. Um, and it gave him an area of conflict with, with his wife, which was a big part of the story. So for his hobby though, I gave him one of mine. I obs I'm obsessed with the strange colonies of parrots outside their natural range. Um, they're all over this country. They're in Europe. I've seen wild parrots in Rome and in San Francisco. So the Colonel has the same obsession. Uh, caged birds are a big part of the story too. So I did some research about that because I really didn't know much about, you know, 
tame parrots, tame cockatiels. And I have a friend who had kept uh, a parrot. Um, and she took me on a tour of Durham, North Carolina to visit parrots. And we went to a parrot happy hour, cocktail party, that is snacks and drinks and parrots flying around the living room. I went to a car wash that keeps a singing parrot in the waiting room. Um, it will sing to women only. It will sing, let me call you sweetheart while doing this really funny thing with its head. I will not do my parrot imitation. Um, I went to a bird rescue and boarding house. And that was the day I discovered that caged birds grieve when they're left alone or are abandoned for long periods by their owners. And that gets folded into my story. So here's a question. Why did I feel this was an important story to tell? Um, no, I think it bothered me that this part of history was not spoken of much and that people still live in enclaves of separation in the South and in, in most places in this country. And especially it bothered me that newcomers like me had very little understanding of the layers of history um, and background where they live. Uh, and I, I was, after 10 years or so, in my community, I had stepped into lots of different communities and kind of began to see how it worked. I was active with a river festival. I was active in the arts. Um, I sold at the farmer's market. I went to a kind of an interesting church that had a long history and was inclusive of Black people. Um, I did a, a lot of, I did some work with at-risk children and I was just seeing how it fit together. And um, uh, another couple of things were haunting me. Toni Morrison says, you have to write about the things you're called to write. And I was definitely called to write this, um, this story called to me um, about, you know, how can a community be in conflict and possibly, uh, is there a vision? Is it possible to have a vision for resolution or, or connection? Um, so I wanted this story to be part of the conversation about history that we've ignored in this country. And I want it to, you know, I want history to be part of the American conversation. And this is, I guess, my contribution for that. So another question is, what are some of the books you've read during the pandemic? Um, I'm, I'm just going to jump ahead and say the books I've read more recently. Uh, one, after I completed my novel and sent it in for publication, um, I read Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmer, and it was a delightful book to read. Um, it was a revelation, her Native American family stories and her um, understanding of biology. She's a PhD in biology and botany felt very close to a feeling that I was trying to accomplish in my novel and feeling that I have about how there are spiritual connections between people um, and between people and nature. Um, so I, I, I felt a real great affinity there, even though I had not read that book before I did my writing. Um, I also been reading some new writers. Uh, Carrie Schlotman has a new novel, Tell Me One Thing, about an artist's life, colliding with the life of an abused girl, and how we look away um, and objectify people who, young people who are in trouble. Um, I really loved reading In the Lonely Backwater by Val Neiman. It's about an outsider girl in high school who gets caught up in the murder investigation of her pretty cousin. Um, I, I really love that for something that it says about being a writer. Um, and it's a, a very spooky book. It, it has a, it's a thriller. It has a really kind of a, you know, makes you sit up straight ending. Um, I also am reading Loving 
The Dead and Gone by Judith Turner Yamamoto. I feel like she has that same sense of um, the, necess the necessity of uh, connecting with grief and connecting with a past. It's about two women in a small mill town in the South who still love the men that they lost. Um, it is beautiful writing. So I would love to read a little from my novel. Let me give you a little setup. This is from about 90 pages in. Um, and it's where the life of Miss Reba Jones and the life of the Colonel collide. A little background. Miss Reba has been grieving her niece, Danielle, her murdered niece, and thinking about her when she was a little girl. Um, and she was, you know, the sweetest girl in the world and uh, really missing, missing her. Um, and the child spirit has started to talk to her. At the same time, she's doing and brewing uh, so much anger and vengeful feeling about how white men have touched her life with violence. And this is only the most recent situation. At Quarryville Feed and Seed, they've got what's left of the baby chicks all piled up in wire boxes, yellow fuzz turning into pin feathers. Danielle used to love when these came every spring, she'd say, Auntie, I need one of those babies. Owner always opened the cage, smiled at the little girl in pigtails, holding yellow fluff in her small brown hands. Danielle, baby, Reba would tell the child, we got chickens at home. She didn't tell her there wasn't much chance of fluffy yellow chicks hatching out of her eggs. She always sold or ate them. Reba listens now for Danielle's voice in her ear, nothing but yellow chicks peeping. Miss Reba goes to the counter to order scratch for her chickens, 50 pounds, and the man says, you got behind a bit, Miss Reba, got to pay each time now. She pulls out 12 flabby ones and some coins from her change purse. When she gets back to the car, the new stock boy has piled her bag of scratch in the trunk. White boy's got no manners, didn't ask where you want it, Miss Reba. Supposed to put it on the passenger seat, sitting up so she can slide it onto the porch. How the blue blazes will she haul it out now? Her back the way it is, that is one deep trunk. Miss Reba's made it this far, so she decides to get all her shopping done at once. A pack of hot dogs, more grits, and a bag of rice from Piggly Wiggly. You can make these things stretch with rice. She pays and gets her hugs. She pays and gets her bags, excuse me. Near the door, a bunch of church people are standing around the newspaper stack, gossiping. They look up and see her jump like they've seen a ghost. They nudge each other, hush their children, mouths fallen open or slammed shut. Didn't see you standing there, Miss Reba. Nobody says, have a blessed day. Miss Reba heads home and it starts to drizzle. She turns on the wipers, the windshield smears with bugs and dust. She grips hard to the wheel to keep from going into the ditch. With a load of chicken scratch in the back and the road wet, this car rides heavy and wants to veer. Up ahead, there's that white man in the red ball cap again, jogging in place in front of the sunrise gas and grill, skinny white legs sticking out his shorts, talking on a cell phone. Old man should have more dignity than to run around half naked like that. She's looking at him so hard that for the first time in her life, she misses her turn onto Field Road. 
Now the man goes to cross the highway, not looking where he's going, still talking on that phone. And her with bald tires, road wet, got to jam on brakes and slide to stop. Man runs into her car, hits it hard, goes down cell phone flying, and she can't see him. Lord Jesus, as she killed a white man in broad daylight, right here in front of the Sunrise Grill. Thank you for listening. You can order Indigo Field at Boulder Books or wherever books are sold. <laughs>